All right, everyone, welcome to the Unsafe Space Book Club. I'm your host, Carter Laren, and I'm joined as almost always, but always for book club. Uh, I'm joined by Carrie Smith. Carrie, are you there? Hi, Carter, I'm here. Hey. Uh, so we have to- almost uh, enough people for Hollywood Squares. We need one more. We, we'll get more. I think more are going to come. So we're, ho- we're here with a whole bunch of unpeople, but we're going to discuss The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt which uh, I literally just finished reading about an hour ago. So, um, and we have, how many people do we have in chat? One, two, three, four, five, six. We have six people and potentially another five or six coming based on who signed up. So, uh, should be fun. Yep. Should be fun. Uh, I'm gonna open up my chat so I can see who's in here on chat. Andrew Thompson. Andrew Thompson's a regular. Hey, Andrew. He listened to the audiobook. Good. Uh, so that he could knit, probably. I'm sure that was the reason. Uh, I'm sure that was the reason. That's why Carlin listens to audiobooks. Okay. So um, yeah, I don't I don't know if we should I don't I don't know really how to start this one. Um I read uh, Righteous Mind and Coddling of the American Mind back to back, so I'm burnt out on uh, on Jonathan Haidt. But hey, don't hate. I know. Don't hide. <laughs> but I'm ching. Thank you for that one. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> we're all we're all envious of Alan in his hammock position. Um, so I guess I don't. I guess the place to start is a, to me, Carrie. I felt like this book synthesized a lot of what we've either been talking about or what we've been wanting to talk about. Like some of the people he mentioned, we've talked about some of the people mentioned we've actually reached out to have interviews with and haven't scheduled yet. Um, He talked about everything from like adolescent or sorry, adverse childhood experience scores to, um, you know, victim uh, culture and, and everything in between. So I I thought it was a pretty good synthesis of a lot of stuff that was going on. I have a few nits uh, nitpicks with it, but in general, I thought it was a pretty good explanation. The thing that I don't like most is that he left out the media's role in this. He he talked about this six factor, you know, the six contributing factors to the the current state of college students, and um, you know, he touched on it briefly, the media, just I mean, very briefly. But yeah. but well, so overall, before we get to nitpicking, yes, I think this is a good primer for people who want to understand what the heck has been going on on college campuses and for anyone who has experienced like a, any kind of social justice mobbing um like the knitting one that we've been talking about quite a bit like carlin is from the knitting world yeah we've got a knitter and uh uh but we but anyone who's experienced that and is not really sure what's happening in fact i recommended this book to a friend of mine who's got two kids in college who she's just started to hear about her daughter's coming home, you know, and she's starting to hear about some of these buzzwords and things. And I was like, you should just really read this book because it's a good primer and it includes a lot of things that, um, especially the the part two where he goes through like what's happening at college campuses. There's a lot of these stories that um, probably a lot of our viewers are familiar with. And certainly there's stories that I was following that helped shaped my awareness of how, what a, what a big, like, I don't know, like what a big, mm, what would you say? Not, I guess, movement, but just a cultural phenomenon that this is. What a big cultural phenomenon this is. And I have some nitpicks too that we can get to. I have some, I have some issues we can, too we, with how it's we right. nitpick, we can, we can stick right. with it. What it, do it, people it, think it about it? Great. Yeah. What do people think about it? Let's, um, let's hear from some people in video chat. Yeah. I think, oh, I think really for, yeah, I thought it was great. For me, like I worked at colleges for about 10 years. And so a lot of my friends and my social circle were made up of people who worked at colleges. And especially in the last two years, I felt like I, like I could, they were acting weird and they were starting to dabble in this stuff and I could never quite figure it out. And it, it clicked it all for me. I was like, oh my God, now I completely understand why they've all lost their minds. <laughs> yes yes they have yes, they like have. he said it can seem that way and unless you once you start to understand i like the way he lays out the great untruths 
And once you start to understand those, then you can look at something like what happened at Evergreen College, or I kept thinking we should tell them about the Ravelry stuff and the knitting stuff, but you can look at something like that and say, oh, I get it now. It seems insane, but when you're in it, this helps ex explain it, these great untruths. Who else was about to say something? I was going to pitch and I was going to say it was a great book and I highly, highly recommendable. You know, looking back when I was back, when I was in college, I didn't really pay attention to the phenomenon, even though I knew that there was, I could sense a little shifting of the sands beneath my feet. But uh, when I was working at, working for the Holocaust Museum, you know, I was really, when, when Jonathan Hyde, he mentions it in this book. The museum was going to give a presentation and guess what? The mob, the outrage mob just came after them and saying, no, no platforming and no civil discourse, none of that. I'm like, yeah, that's been the sum of my life like ever since 2015. Yeah. Every, every what, what, single time I try to encourage openness and just trying to just figure things out, people are like, yeah, no, I'm not going to associate with anybody, even if they happen to be um, any minority you could think of, gay, Jewish, Asian, Black, didn't matter. If, any, if you encourage anyone to just talk about ideas, no, just people were not on board with that whatsoever, and they would try to not just discourage it, they would actively try to shame you for doing it. Yeah. What years were you in college? What what was this? What years? I graduated in 2013. Okay, so right at the start of what he describes as the beginning of this whole movement. Right. So that's why it mostly fell under the radar for me because I graduated just as it was really starting to pick up steam. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, since we're talking about college, I went to I went to college at a very liberal liberal arts college in Southern California. I mean, really, really super progressive. And this was back between 87 and uh, 91. And I saw this, the beginnings of this, there was like these radical feminists that were, that were, uh, you know, not, you know, saying that, you know, you can't, def I don't, I don't, it's, but it, it was so, um, it's so much reminded me of that of all that stuff that was going on even then it was such a proto in that, in that proto form it was just yeah really... you know i went to school like similarly well, well before the rise of all this stuff and um the one the one of the i don't want to get into nitpicks too much with with jonathan height yet but one of the nitpicks i have about him generally and and i think he would admit this uh he's he comes at when he talks about uh philosophic principles He's very much about uh, the d descriptive analysis of them, not a philosophic analysis. So this is what people think it is, not what it actually should be. And he's and he's very much a pragmatist. What I got from this book was like, you know, here's what's happening from a very pragmatic perspective. Here's the six uh, contributing factors that's kind of like leading to the rise of this. But overall, there was not really a philosophic. Uh, understanding of what the seeds of all this were like why why are these things six things happening now and what are some of the kind of misconceptions philosophically that have been taught because you know this stuff didn't just start in 2013 magically this has been brewing for a long long time right and some of those social indicators he talked about was also seemed like good but also kind of small in in, re in re relation to i think a more important thing like the philosophy yeah. And in fact, Andrew Thompson in chat brought this up. Uh, one problem that he had is that uh, Jonathan, I, I won't say Jonathan, it could be John, Greg, but whatever, the authors um, explicitly try and separate what they consider good social justice ideology from bad social justice ideology. And, you know, their notion of the good part is what they call proportional procedural so social justice. But then they go on to describe it in a way where it actually isn't a necessary concept. It's it's justice that it, it basically it's it's when things violate either distributive or procedural justice, which he's already defined and talked about. So there's really no need for this extra category, and I view it really as a kind of virtue signal to 
the social justice crowd to kind of say, well, we kind of get you, but you're doing it wrong. Um, and even the version of social justice that they embraced is still anti-individual. The example they gave was like at high school, if it's 80% white and 20% black and we vote on, uh, if we vote on what music to have at the prom, well, we're likely gonna have white music at the prom because it's the majority will, will, will vote. And, you know, he used that as this example of like, clearly there's a social justice problem here that needs to be solved. And someone who's an individualist like me looked at that and went, why are we caring what race people are when they're voting on songs? Like, do all black people like the same music and all white people like a different kind of music? Like, why is that the analysis? Why is that the framework, guys? Um, so I was disappointed that they, they accept the collectivist premise of social justice. They're just complaining about the implementation specifics. I have a comment about that. And I'm sorry, I was a little bit distracted because there's a couple of people in the Facebook group who said they didn't get the link. So I just messaged them. So we might have a couple more people joining. But um, one thing I like about Jonathan Haidt, I both dislike it and like it. <laughs> he does accept some of these premises, but that's good. I think it's good because he's he is not someone who's criticizing the social justice ideology from the right. He's a liberal. Do you know what I mean? Well, and it he, will certainly make him more easy to for liberals to hear. Yes. But I, I mean, that's basically what I thought may, in, when in reading some of it, I thought to myself that he might be kind of a gateway drug for people who need to maybe see it, some of their, some of the failings of their ideology, their SJW ideology from a perspective of someone who's not being just blatantly critical of every single thing that, you know, he kind of, he does have, uh, and he says that he is a, a Democrat and has, you know, and he, they have leftist idea, left leaning ideas, center left. So he admits that he comes from that perspective. I think it would be easy for a person who didn't want to read anything from a conservative to read this and get some of the same ideas that you guys talk about. Well, I don't think like being a liberal though, cause I'm, I'm very, very <laughs> liberal. <laughs> I yeah, don't think being a liberal talking. needs to be fun, like is fundamentally opposed to, no, no, um, no. to um, like endorsing that, you know, there's individual responsibility involved in these things and we're responsible for our actions. We're responsible for what we say. And we're responsible if we, you know, commit violence against someone that we disagree with. I I, I don't know. I, I agree that it made it a little bit more palatable, but um, I also don't think that being against this is a fundamentally conservative thing. Yeah, thank you for saying that because I yeah, thought- I also, worded that wrong. Yeah. I, I, that's not what I meant, but I no, worded it. You're I don't right. Think, You're right. I don't, think you, I don't think you worded it wrong. I think you guys are saying the same thing, but in different ways. It's like. I think that I think that it's good to hear a liberal voicing opposition to this belief system because um, for so long it's been only conservatives making arguments against it. And so I, as a person who could still consider myself liberal, also I really look. We can all we can all um, to varying degrees um, throw out some of the underlying premises. Like we probably don't all agree on these. I'm sure we don't on the underlying premises. Like some of us might still think white privilege is a thing that we should talk about and address or male privilege or, you know, and other, other people might be hardcore, like, no, that's not, that's just a, a damaging concept and we shouldn't uh, talk about, you know what I mean? Like it's, we probably all have varying degrees on how useful those things are, but we all agree, I think, that the, the, that this ideology overall is counterproductive and it's not, it's not doing what it claims to be doing. I, guess well, I, I think, that, agree with I think we all agree that the I ideas should be that we should be open to discuss the ideas and challenge the concepts without being labeled as some sort of radical right or radical left. We should be able to bring those ideas to the middle to discuss it. I mean, yeah. he's very right about we should, that. We should live up to uh, live up to our ideal that we should preserve the open free marketplace of ideas, you know, right. instead of just acting like shims and just throwing dung at each other. <laughs> right. Some which, of is, this, which is a great metaphor for college campus today. Some of this- Unfortunately, is, yes. Some of this is where I don't think 
I know Jonathan Haidt has mentioned it, but I've heard of it of other sources. When you get everybody together in the same group that agree, they tend to shift more towards the extreme. And when you're in an extreme and you never get correct feedback, you go, we're right. We're so right. We're totally right. We're, and then you've got the moral branding of the left of we're good. We're smart. We're moral. We're educated. We're kind. We're educated. And you have all these great things and go, well, all I hear is this K through college. All I hear is this through most entertainment and academia and news. Well, I'm totally reinforced. Let's move further over to the extreme and be religiously invested in the political ideology because for them, liberal equals good and good equals liberal. And whatever you do to further the power or influence of the ideology is acceptable because you're good and everything that you do to help it is good no matter the consequences, the law or other people or actual harm done. Hence, let's ignore due process and go after the blasphemer, the unbeliever in social justice. Right, that's the us versus them mentality that he describes in the book. Um, yeah, I mean, I look, I don't want to... So I have my problems with Jonathan Haidt's philosophy and, and the book. However, I, I like we can't ask one book to do everything. So, oh. like, you know... He's not going into the philosophical foundations. He may not even understand the philosophical foundations, but he certainly understands how the 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 bad philosophy has manifest. And whether he recognizes what's bad philosophy or not, that may not he might not totally recognize it. But he certainly recognizes the um, at, at least the symptoms as being problematic. At least he sees that you know where things are going is a problem, and he's correctly, I think finds some some decent contributory factors i happen to think a lot of those contributory factors have other causes that could be investigated more deeply but maybe we can't ask for that out of a i don't know 300 page book well one thing uh to go to um was it alan's point about learning about some of the like the underpinnings of this philosophy when uh he was he was in school like i did i learned i was indoctrinated 20 years ago in college and Yes, we didn't have the safe spaces, the trigger warnings. We didn't have all of that. We didn't have, um, actually we did, we did try and ban some speakers. I remember Cookie Roberts was our graduation speaker and we tried to get her banned. I forgot about Cookie Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> but we did, we weren't successful. We didn't use the same tactics they use today. But, um, but we did, I was, I was indoctrinated then. And I think one thing that could have made this stronger for, was when he was talking about, so, so why, why did things change? And he sort of gets into social, he starts talking about social media, right? The prevalence of having an, an iPhone in your hand as you're developing um, preteen and middle schooler, right? But, but with the social media comes the ideology. And he didn't seem to make that connection. It's not just that girl, he's like, why are girls more negatively impacted by social media? Well, maybe it's because girls compare themselves to their peers more, et cetera, et cetera. All of that could be true. But another thing that comes with social media that I kept waiting for him to talk about was the indoctrination is now happening on your phones. It doesn't have to happen at college. And so I was part of that. I left college and I went to the Ms. Magazine uh, boards. Ms. Magazine used to have uh, a website with message boards. And I also went to Chick Click with a bunch of other SJWs. And we, we went and were basically preaching the stuff we had learned in school. So, I, and I kind of feel like, you know, these kids are being raised on, he talks about they're not, um, you know, kids are not uh, playing as much in real life with other people. They're spending more time in so solitary, you know, on their devices. And so it's like, well, no wonder when they get to college, they're treating it like a Tumblr comment section because that's where they're spending all their time. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah. Um, he also, he also, um, He's, I think as Scott Adams would say, I feel like to some extent he's watching the wrong movie. Um, like he's, he was making statements about things like he used it, for example, he used like the, the very fine people Trump stuff, which is a total yeah. lie. But he that. gets that his news from the mainstream media and is assuming that, like I actually don't, 
I'm not convinced that there's such this, this huge rise of right, right, white nationalism violence. Like, I think it's just reported more. I don't know that there's an enormous rise of it. And I haven't seen convincing evidence of that. But he just buys that as like a given. He takes that as a given. And he, the reason I question his invest, like how much he actually investigated that is because he also did this very fine people thing with Trump, which was, you know, it just takes 30 seconds on the internet to find out that that was a lie. Well, you know, I did notice, I mean, does anybody know if this was used like as a master's thesis or something? I mean, the citations are amazing. But the one thing that I did notice on that section where he did the deal about Charlottesville is the citation he has for that. He uses an article that I think he wrote himself in the Atlantic or some publication. Yeah, so the book that started part, out as the Atlantic article. That was right. the first part of the book. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think oh, that it was a different article, though. I mean, a different. It was a different article that he had written about that specific event. So I just I was kind of disappointed that that I mean that was one of the things that I felt kind of disappointed because the citations in the book are so good. I just thought maybe. It's so easy my, for me to look over that kind of stuff because um, it, people's assuming the, uh, I don't know, being credulous of the mainstream media, it's it's so commonplace that you kind of, it's easy for me to forgive people for believing us various narratives that you hear on the mainstream. It's just like, well, whatever, let's get on to what your point is. And, and, it, it, and it's more of a psychological, I mean, he was trying to stay in his lane in, in a way, like he was trying to keep it to the psychology you know, his, his strengths. And so it's like, well, okay, just, well, then stay there. You know, good, great. Because I was noticing that yeah. some of that stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Alan, you look like a pair of floating glasses in a cave. Yeah. I know. It, well, I feel like I'm in a sci-fi I, I love Wolfgang's hat. I have to say, that's like my new favorite hat. I'm wearing unsafe. Wait, what oh, is this? Space merch. Oh, nice. <laughs> Carter, look what he's wearing. <laughs> Wolfgang, you're not supposed to be on on Carrie's side on this. <laughs> How come it's not red? Well, it's, 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 it's red. Democrats. It says big Democrats, liberal again, and proper Democrats is blue. So, I thought yeah. Alan was wearing a gas mask earlier because yeah. I just had one picture up. <laughs> Rather, I couldn't found the I hadn't found the gallery view yet. So I thought it was a gas mask, which I thought was an uh, incredible addition. <laughs> yeah, we have our really cool heroes and villains. I have a que I have a question. I need ever, you know, and I've even listened to Brett Weinstein or is it Weinstein? How do you say that? His um, <laughs> interviews. <laughs> Weinstein. Weinstein. His interviews with various publications, but in here it talks about how that whenever the incident happened that he um, was interviewed first on Fox, which is not something I was aware of. I wasn't aware of it until after, way longer after it happened. Does anybody know why? I mean, I uh, think he, why he went on Fox News. Right. I mean, because the, the, the kind of the way that it's written was sort of that that was one of the reasons why there was such a huge backlash against what was going on at Evergreen, not necessarily a protest against why, you know, the protest of what was actually happening there, but because it was white ringer wingers who were attacking because he had went on Fox News and like this stirred is, up uh, this nest. This is, it is a difficult uh, thing to cover since oh, I haven't been in such a little bit of my time. It's like over the course of like four days or maybe even a week. Um, but I get my material from this uh, great guy called Benjamin Boyce. He's pretty much started a whole documentary uh, about this whole thing. And I've seen that, I've seen that. Yeah, and I think the, based on what I rem remember from that was the reason why Brett went on Fox News is because, well, it was the only platform at the time that would take him seriously. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Because that is he asked what I was wondering. Like, because he, 
the, the mainstream media or whatever you want to call it at the time that was pretending like stuff like this just wasn't really important or whatever and uh, and uh besides this brett class said keep in mind for the audience brett is a, a progressive he was part right. of the occupy wall street uh, he uh, made videos against that uh, was some of the videos critical of capitalism and a lot of videos that were critical of racism. And yet the outrage mob was gotten for his head on a platter. So uh, yeah, this was like the left, as they say, eating itself. So of course, uh, a lot of left-leaning big mainstream outlets were not going to take his side because, well, they weren't going to risk uh, the hate mob. But the right, on the other hand, who was treating this like a real thing, they've been um, watching uh, schools and colleges under a microscope for years. You know, what are they teaching these kids? Yeah, you know, all this stuff. And then finally, when this huge anarchy broke out at Evergreen, well, of course they were going to let right on it. So Brett, I, I'm guessing, just roll the dice and just went with it. He's like, you guys are the, the ones that are gonna take me seriously, ask the questions and you're gonna get the word out what the heck's going on. And uh, I think he made the right call. No, I mean, I, I totally agree. I just, I think it's one of those things where you're kind of, it's a shame that they were the only ones who would listen to him. Is it too dark? No, my what I heard too is, and, and again, like I, higher education everyone knows everyone so i have friends that that know people who work there and what i heard too is that the the people that worked at evergreen were one of the things that happened after the fox news interview is there was a a threat of a gunman to come to campus from from the right wing and to, to shoot it all up and god knows that's awful but the campus blamed brett for that happening and that was part of why the backlash was so big yeah, they had to uh, uh, jump onto that. I mean, it was, I would say, yeah, it's it's an important thing to, uh, to, uh, to, to consider. Someone was coming down or threatening to come down there and cause mayhem, but it did distract us from the thing that started this whole mess. They accused Brett of something he was not guilty of, like, at all. Right. They could not source any evidence whatsoever to uh, condemn him. So they had to uh, switch things up and say, look, he's enabling uh, white supremacists because he went on the foxes and now they're uh, threatening to hurt us. Right. Well, I, they're still holding on to that like years later though, because I posted about the evergreen thing on my Facebook maybe a month or two back saying like, something that happened remind, reminded me of this crazy college incident. I had people jump on it like that, be like, Carlin, what about that gunman that came to campus? It's really all Brett Weinstein's fault. They're still holding on to it as though <laughs> generally lose its mind. But, it, but, but see, they don't, they don't, it's funny how they can divorce the chain of events at a point, whatever point they like. It's like, he wouldn't have had to go on Fox News, A, if any liberal or slash mainstream news outlets had asked him on which he said he went on there because they were the only ones that want to talk to him. And yeah, and B, uh, he wouldn't have had anything to talk about if they hadn't have lost their minds <laughs> and endangered his life and his safety and descended into chaos. Like it's like this weird thing of they want to trace responsibility back to a certain point and then just completely divorce it from everything that led up to that point. Which is, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean it seemed like to me that there was a little bit of that in my reading and maybe, I don't know, that was, was kind of what I was reading a little bit. Well, these people did that, but it was only because this happened and then tracing it back into a round where it's like, okay, wait a minute, are we blaming the victim now? Because I, I mean, I didn't think we were supposed to blame the victim, but in the case of, you know, that professor, I feel like he really was victimized. I mean, he was completely taken. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. He definitely was. So yeah, like essentially he, they are blaming the victim. It was terrible. I mean, it's a terrible thing. And people got, I mean, they were, when I watch videos of that, it's, it's really frightening, really frightening to see yeah, people they, have they, that kind of mob mentality. 
Right. It's a lynch mob mentality. They cornered him. They stalked him. They were searching the car to car for him. Yeah, this was serious. So, uh, yeah, he had to uh, put it out there like, hey, uh, these liberal colleges were descending into anarchy. You know, I, he had to, uh, he was the victim and he had to call it out. And people were blaming him, the victim, for putting the word out there and bringing attention to uh, a lot of right wingers out there. Have you mostly moderate people too, but of course, because since right wingers responded and uh, reacted and just saying like, uh, oh, action must be taken or whatever, then, well, that's what Kerry said. That's where they're going to cut off the narrative and just stick with that. Has anybody seen um, the movie No Safe Spaces? Not it just yet. came out. No, I really want to. Yeah, I well, have- it opened in like 11 theaters. But luckily, one of them was not that far away from me. So I drug my 16-year-old to it last weekend. Yay! But <laughs> there was definitely, there was a big portion of the movie that was about the Evergreen College thing and really uh-huh. like put all of the video together in a coherent narrative where you could kind of see it play out and what went down there and how horribly frightening the whole thing was so highly recommend once it gets you know just I, put out there that everybody see it i cannot wait for it to come out i was one of the early donators so i'm sure me too one of the, one of the digital <laughs> i was waiting all like two years i'm like when are you guys gonna release this movie i gave you money like a really long time ago is it ever I, coming out by the time I, it comes out it's not even gonna be important i know i know i was getting really anxious myself Unfortunately, it's so, still important. <laughs> yeah. Maybe even more important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There is a book. It came out over a month ago. It is available on Amazon. So you have been able to buy the No Safe Spaces book that covers this in greater depth. And I would see the movie if they had any showings in my state. I just yeah. don't understand why it's in Arizona and not in Texas. We yeah, have, I think there were three out. theaters in Colorado that showed it. I mean, I had to drive an hour to see it, but I feel like I found it in three different theaters here. And I was like, it's only 11 places across the whole country. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for bringing it up about the book. I actually bought the book and I'm actually starting to read it. Well, Dr. Jordan Peterson's documentary came out and most theaters would not even cover it because they were afraid of the liberal lynch mobs. And the one or two that accepted it got shut down because the employees said, I'm offended. You have to ban it. So they canceled it. So now you can get Dr. Jordan Peterson's movie as a DVD on Amazon, but you can't find that in the theater either. So it's a, the left wing is the one that is right now shutting down books, attacking speakers, getting movies banned. And how many people, if I go for a, Indian or art house film, I can probably think of three theaters in the Dallas metro area that play it. Here you've got movies like No Safe Spaces and Dr. Jordan Peterson's that are books that have sold millions or by authors that have sold millions of copies and you can't get it in a theater? That's fear by the theater owners more than anything else that would explain it. Yeah, and they, and they have the audacity to call the right the fascists. You can't, you can't platform Nazis, okay? You can't get on the platform. You cannot. I, have a, I wanted to point out something in the book um, that I underlined a couple different times. Again, because we've just been talking about the SJW uh, sort of takeover or what happened in the, the witch hunt in the knitting world. And it was the... It was the fourth thing that he talked about that has that happens in a witch hunt, and that fourth thing being that yeah. people are afraid to defend the person who's been attacked. And the example he gave, I remember that example. The um, the woman who wrote the piece about transracialism and how all of the other all of these other academics just rounded up the wagons and they brought their pitchforks and they went after her and you know, the fact that it, it, it's so very telling that he said, you know, there was one, only one professor at Evergreen that was willing to stand up for Weinstein, one. And there was, and there was only one that I recall, and it was that woman's advisor 
who stood up for her and all the rest of them were emailing her, you know, we support you, but that we can't say anything publicly because we're too afraid or even worse, attacking her publicly while defending her privately. That's the ultimate in cowardice. There's so many examples of cowardice in this book. I just kept, I found, I found as I was taking notes, I just finally quit. Right. I kept writing down coward, <laughs> but, then, but, but I think, I think that's just, it's such a big, it's such a big part of why this has been allowed. This ideology has been allowed to spread as far as it has and to have so many far reaching effects is because of fear because people are so afraid. And, and, and this relates to what you're talking about, Tamara, and, and about people shutting down the, the screenings of, of the documentary. And just there's just this fear that people have. Of, I mean, who cares? How bad is it going to be? The university president, for example, at Evergreen, I think is one of the most cowardly people I've ever seen on video footage. And it's like, how did we get such weak people in these positions? I, I don't know. I'm kind of rambling here, but the fear so, thing was big for me. Well, I don't think it's thought, always... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I just think it's a little bit of a, of a uh, negative feedback loop of the three great untruths. It's like you see people who are believing their feelings all the time. They have these feelings and they're, they're believing it because it's real. And then they also have this dichotomous thinking that they're, they're good. So that must mean you're bad, you're evil, and I'm going to fight you. And and that, and then again, it's that whole thing. And then, then the, the people who don't stand up, they might be having a little bit of that feeling like, oh, well, if this doesn't kill me, it's going to make me weak. If I stand up, I'm going to actually get hurt. You know, because... If it doesn't kill me, it makes me weaker. So it's this negative feedback loop that leads to this totalitarian shame circle of, of horribleness. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think point, it's yeah. I don't think it's always just fear though, because I know for me when I first started like tiptoeing into the knitting thing, it it was um, months ago when they all started coming out and attacking sock petition. And, and all I did, and I didn't understand what was going on. I was not really paying attention to it. All I did was post a comment on a very well-known knitters um, post denouncing Sockmetician. And, I, and he, he apologized, like, I'm sorry, I didn't denounce him sooner, all this stuff. I posted something to the effect of, you know, you should never be pressured into saying anything, say something in your own time, something like that. I got hate mail for three straight days. And it was just a comment on an Instagram post. I had no idea what was going on. And I really, I mean, that was part of what drew me to all of this because I wanted to understand it more, but it wasn't fear that held me back. It was, I just literally had no sense of what was happening to me. Yeah, thank goodness, like uh, programs like this exist to help tell people what the hell's going on who are at the moment just oblivious. Well, you gotta understand that their, uh, their whole method of operating is based on social pressure like they don't they, they reject arguments so social social pressure is everything for them so for you to wander in and say hey use your own mind and be authentic and only apologize when you're ready that's like one of the worst things you can say to the mob it's like no 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 there's, there's do not think for yourself yeah well, you know, I want to touch on what Alan uh, talks about regarding the cycle. Another reason why I like this book particular, the fact that Jonathan Haidt is liberal, I'm really glad uh, that liberals speak up because I think that helps break the cycle. They have, because these uh, people that have the us versus them mentality, they think that the them are center right or even further right, but when they hear from a little leftists and liberals, not just like Hyde, but also Helen Pluckrose, James Lindsay, and Peter Bogosian, you know, those great stars. And they've, that's when they're going to have to learn or realize that they are illiberal and authoritarian and they have lost their way. So when they see it from liberals like them and liberals like me and like many of us here, um, hopefully that will real make them realize that they're stuck in a cycle and they'll just have to pause and hopefully. Yeah. I mean, I, I may not like, uh, I may not like parts of the book and, and I do think he, he used some hoaxes to make his point, but it will resonate with people who are, who consider themselves on the left um, and are wondering like, why is this, what's going on? And can someone that I trust talk to me? I think he, he's got their, 
trust a little bit more. He speaks in their language. You know, when I look at the book, though, I don't know what you guys think about it, but um, the big takeaway that I liked the most wasn't like he didn't he didn't really enlighten me philosophically as to what was going on at all. Um, we already kind of knew a lot of that. The polarization cycle stuff, I didn't, you know, he, he based a lot of it on hoaxes. But the stuff that I liked the most was his, his the three of his factors, three of his six factors were uh, anxiety and depression, paranoid parenting, and the decline of play. And those are things that have been interesting to me that I think are, they're like direct psychological causes that I don't know that they would lead to social justice necessarily, but they certainly... Uh, they're certainly enablers for being susceptible to this kind of ideology and behaving like a lunatic in college. Um, and they are things that I think are prevalent that people don't think about a lot. Um, so, you know, as a parent and just as someone who thinks about childhood psychology, I actually really liked those things. Um, I don't know if anyone else had opinions about that, but like the decline of play, that's a big one. Um, there, are, there is a lot of paranoid parenting stuff going on. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know if anyone has thoughts about that, but I, I liked that discussion. He, you know, he talked about adverse childhood experience scores, all that kind of stuff. I thought the parenting part of this book was phenomenal. And that's where I really like tapped into it, but I have four kids. So, and they range from 18 to three. So I've really seen sort of a, a huge shift in the way people parent and the way schools behave and I have my, my older boys have one father. My daughter has a different father. Um, and my daughter's father, I can see him play into how much we've been trained just over the last decade to completely bubble wrap and insulate and get away from teaching perseverance and grit and all of these really important human characteristics. Um, but I can see it throughout all of my children and through the schools that they went through and kind of the bullshit that school was going through at the same time where it's like, make it as easy as possible, make the bar as low as possible, um, reinforce everybody's self-esteem and sort of, I can see that all four of my children have been raised in society that is coddling. And Do you it's, see a difference between your three and your eighteen-year-old in that in the like, environment? No, oh, they're really different humans, so it's difficult for me to talk about. Is you know, my my oldest son is definitely my most difficult child, um, and my daughter, after all these boys, is a whole different human and ball of energy. So it's hard for me to, to remark on it because I know them so personally as individuals, but I definitely see exactly what he's talking about and how it has infiltrated all the way down to the lowest levels of school and how frightening that is. And just how little we expected children. Like I think about the books I read, I always was like kind of a history dork and loved historical movies and history books. And I think about like, you know, Dickensian street urchins and what a four-year-old orphan was capable of doing mm. 150 years ago. Yep. yep. And I, you know, in this society, we don't give my 12-year-old that much. Like, are you freedom to take? Like, I'm like, holy shit, these four-year-olds were feeding themselves, clothing themselves, surviving on the streets. And it's, it's crazy how stupid we think humans are now. Yeah, and, it, 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 there is. He, he kind of said, hey, childhood is taking longer. He recommended gap year um, before college. I'm <laughs> all about gap year. I really am. I don't, all three of my boys, I'm like, none of them. And I have an 18 year old who in fact dropped out of school this a month ago and is now taking his GED. Finally, he should have done this a couple of years ago. I should have homeschooled all my kids, but I'm divorced. I'm not with my daughter's father. So it's kind of hard to reckon with um, shared custody to homeschool. Mm -hmm. But um, I, there's no way I would send any of my boys directly into university right now. 
They're emotionally not ready. They don't understand money. They don't understand the real world. They would all just go and have fun and rack up a ton of debt and then get completely indoctrinated into a bunch of crazy bullshit. You know, it's what's weird is we like, on the one hand, he says like, oh, kids are taking longer to grow up. But on the other hand, like, you know, there is this push for, uh, at least for, to get into elite schools to have, have all this, you know, resume building, which he talks about. Um, and, you know, I, I would much prefer a society in which the kids were emotionally ready to go to college early. They just didn't have the academics yet because they could learn the academics in college. Like, that's fine. Right. But we're not preparing their person to be ready. We're preparing their, like, okay, they've got the vocabulary and their math skills are ready and they know enough science to go learn. But we're not, we're not preparing their personhood to actually be away from home and in college. Well, and, and that's yeah. totally just it because there's so many parents that, like, you know – I, we're in Boulder County. So this is like tiger mom central. Okay. This is a bunch of really overeducated moms who don't have jobs outside the home. So our job is our children. I kind of bucked the trend by being sort of a free range parent human, but I am surrounded by extremely hyper driven, um, Stanford or bust moms who really are pushing this, where it's all about following this exact same path and what your kid has to do. And so it's all about the grades. So I know moms that their kids come home and they sit down and they do homework with their kids every single night, every single question, and their kids get straight A's. Um, And their kids are going to make all of these, you know, standardized test sort of things. But when they let them go into the real world, it's not like they can, or not even the real world to the fake world of college. They can't go off to college with them. And it's, it's really hard. Uh, But some of them try. Some of them do try. That's true. That's true. Depending on what Carter was talking about, prepping them for college emotionally, uh, to touch back on Jonathan Hyde's book, I think he gave two suggestions of what can be done. I, I remember one of them being get the kid a job. Yeah. You know, it helped. It worked for me. At least. My first job was when I was 15 working at a racetrack. So right. prepping kids in high school, getting them a part time job, uh, just getting them in that environment, I think will uh, might, might be able to make an impact in prepping them to compete in college. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more with that. In fact, I, this is going to make me sound like a Mr. Burns or something, but uh, I really hate child labor laws because... Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, my wow. daughter is only 10, but like, there's a couple like part-time job things that she could do. Um, like she rides horses, like she could do some stuff at the stables and like they would want her to do it. They would pay her crap for a couple hours of weekends to go do it, but they're not allowed to. They'll get in trouble. And I'd really want her to have that experience of having a job. And I worked under the table when I was young. Um, and it's just a lot harder to have to go under the table. Like kids aren't learning how to have jobs. Like we literally have a culture of people who don't know how to show up on time, don't know how to like listen to their boss, don't know how to behave professionally in any way. Um, you know, it's that that goes a long way. Right. And, I thought, if, I, and if these kids start treating uh, their bosses like they do their professors, they're gonna they're gonna have a job in a heartbeat. Yo, not even though. No, not even because I'm an organizational psychologist, and so I work with these organizations. I'll tell you what: the managers now are millennials, and a lot of them they they weren't quite in college around that time but a lot of them have adopted these ideas and it is like the hardest thing in the world to go in and try to convince them that these habits are wrong and that they're not doing these kids any favors i totally i agree my my ex-boyfriend my daughter's father owned two jimmy john's shops which those the people you hire there are obviously like you know low skill actually that's not obvious what's a jimmy john's shop oh you don't know what jimmy john's is the sub shop Mm -hmm. I actually live in Charleston, Illinois, which is where shop number one is. Okay. Well, you know what a Jimmy John's is. Okay. It's like a subway. Okay. 
but okay. So he owned um, a couple of Jimmy John's and managing those people for him was it, it drove him to sell his two businesses because he could not manage people where, you know, you'd get people saying they wanted a job. They wouldn't like call or show for their, um, you know, interviews, or they would come to the interview, get hired and then not show up to the first day of work. And then there'd be people that call them and are like, Oh, I'm just really stressed about money right now. I don't know how I'm going to keep my car. So I need to stay home today and just like, really chill out, mellow out, and take a mental health day. <laughs> yeah, <I'm funny. laughs> right. The whole time. Well, You're... I have a solution. You could come to work and make money and then pay for that. I've got, I'm, I can see this definite trend. I've got two kids in high school now and the school district sent out about two weeks ago. Are you turning 18? Answers to FAQs for students and parents. I thought, oh, this is talking about college planning or how to pay for college. No, this is turning 16 or 18. Entering adulthood can feel tricky, but we've got a checklist along with valuable tips from a panel of professional experts to make it smoother. Come learn important decisions your team will be making in areas of banking, credit, auto insurance, healthcare contracts, self-advocacy, and law. A lot of that what? should be teaching. It's how to fill out a job application, how to fill out an easy 1040 form, what you need to know when you sign up for a credit card. I've been talking to my kids about this for years, so part of that's due to Dave Ramsey. And I know that there's a general demand for this because the email I just read off was from the school district. There's another one from a church near us that is teaching adulting classes. I looked at it just for the sake of my kids and went cooking, yep. both of them can do, sewing, eh, my daughter can do it, my son may hire somebody, but he's got Boy Scout skills, how to do laundry, I, and just a regular checklist of things you need to know as an adult. My kids had that down. They've got people signing up. We're in a middle class neighborhood in a upper end school district. And it's like, if they are organizing classes like this on an institutional level, it's widespread. What do you think the difference is though? Because was it that previous generations learned this stuff from their parents and now their kids are not learning it from their parents? Cause I didn't learn about credit from my, I learned about credit cause Tamara sent me a Dave Ramsey book. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't learn about it from my parents, but what do you think the difference is? Is it? Is I, it think, I think the difference, not maybe with credit, but with all the like just regular adulting things, the chores, the how to do your laundry, how to do dishes, how to keep houses, that we are all collectively extremely affluent. So the amount of people who have housekeepers and people that help and the amount of like chores that are doled out. I mean, I have a bunch of friends who, who don't have any of that, who still don't make their, their kids do chores and their kids look at it as like they're being picked on or punished or something if they have to do chores and they have to help out. Even like single mom friends who I'm like, uh, you got to make your friends help out or your friends, your kids help out, you know, the older kids have to do this stuff so that they can learn how, but also because you need help and they're doing everything. Yeah. We had chore charts when my kids were two, three, four, five years old, and it was basic stuff that was age appropriate. You know, two-year-old at the end of the day, pick up your toys and put them in the toy box. When you're five, set the table with just plates and cups and, you know, you don't have to carry the knives around. So we had our kids on a tour chart and giving them money. There were times that people were critical of us for doing that. You know, you're the adult. You need to be doing this. I'm like, he made the mess. He needs to be picking up Legos. I don't care if he's making the game and throwing it in the box. He needs to clean up the mess. Because there's going to be a point I'm not around. I think part of it was that I look at the, what was the saying? I am not here to take care of my children. I am here to raise adults. 
my job is to prepare them for being adulthood because to be a mother is to be left. I need to have them when they leave able to sign a job application and figure out how to handle a job. Otherwise they're going to be living in the basement. I need them to have the academics, but get them into a educational program, credentials, whatever, so that they can support themselves because I can't. They need to have knowledge on how do you go to the doctor? How do you do the dentist? How do you understand the payment stuff? So we were much more proactive, but that used to be a traditional point of view. The other thing I've seen is that these schools, I think around eighth grade, we had part of our life skills class with how do you fill out a job application? How do you fill out an easy 1080? The kids are learning how to put on condoms, but they don't know how to fill out a job application. I don't know about a welfare application, but I don't think that's getting done either. They also don't know how to quit. I mean, none of them even know how to put in two weeks and like do the two weeks. I don't, I don't think what, like they don't, I don't, I don't, I think there's something deeper than like, they don't know how to do it. There's something about their motivation and their sense of self-respect and obligation to other people and, and willingness to be part of a society and live by rules. Um, because, you know, well, so this is, I, I forget who's talked about this before too, but, um, Jonathan Haidt focused mostly on the more affluent people and the problems of their parenting. Um, but uh, we have entire generations now of kids who, for like two or three generations, no one has held the job. It's like a, it's like a welfare, um, like welfare mom has a welfare kid, has another welfare kid. And so there's none of that institutional knowledge that Tamara was talking about or Tamara was talking about where like, this is how to fill out a job application. This is how to go about, you know, taking care of yourself. That kind of knowledge that you'd expect to be part of a family has, has dissipated. And there's kids that are growing up with, like, no role models around them who know how to function in society independently. So it's no wonder they don't know. Going, going back to what you, go, what you were talking about before, about... Um, real world education. So growing up, my oldest son was super difficult for me to deal with, but also for schools to deal with. He was, you know, gave, given all these different diagnoses, but my ex-husband and I just sort of um, dogmatically refused to medicate. Uh, what I used to wish for, especially for boys, is that there was some sort of like apprenticeship program where I could have just like said, like, go be a blacksmith at like, you know, eight years old, giving him over to a blacksmith shop and then like run wild because all the kid wanted to do was run around, play with hot things, play with swords. And I was like, I would love to go back in time with this kid and be able to just indenture him into this <laughs> skill. It because he's work. not set out for what um, current education requires of every single human to sit there in your desk and learn all of what they're teaching and, and teach to the test and regurgitate all of that stuff. He, he was like born as a night squire and I had nowhere to send him that he could be accepted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be good for him. I, I, I also think that we're, you know, we discount the trades. Everyone feels like they have to send their kids to uh, college and get a crappy degree in, you know, gender studies or whatever it is, which is useful. Um, but, you know, no one, how, no one knows how to do basic plumbing or, you know, electrician work or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the trades are valuable. The thing I disagree with Jonathan Haidt about is he talked about uh, – in the gap year, either getting a job or doing some sort of volunteer service. I, I much prefer a job because, and, and this is, look, I've hired a lot of people in my life. I've also had volunteers for events. There's a way different dynamic when you're a volunteer than when you're being hired. Um, and when you're a volunteer, you feel like you're, everything you do is that the person should be grateful for because you're showing up for free and you're volunteering and there's a, there's a different kind of sense of what that relationship is and they need to learn the, and, and actually there's no measurement of productivity when you're volunteering. It's like, if you show up and do a crappy job, at least people are happy that you showed up. 
when you're working, you need to earn more than they're paying you or you're fired. You need to actually produce something and be of value. Um, and it's much harder to have a job. So I actually, I don't think they should go to some sort of stupid national volunteer service crap. We don't need commie stuff. We need jobs. We need people to go learn how to have a job on their own and earn money on their own. Um, that bothered me about his book, but that's a pet peeve. <clears throat> I think there's been a big emphasis on rights and self-actualization to the point of narcissism and nothing on responsibility. That's one reason why Dr. Jordan Peterson is so popular. He's talking about responsibilities and go take up responsibilities, achieve them and meet them and you'll have real self-esteem feeling proud of what you've done. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on these are my rights, I'm entitled. A job to you. You want that money? You do, based on the contract, what you said you're going to do, and do it right. Well, a little bit of grace while you're training. If you're not a match for the job, if you don't have the skills, if you're not going to have the work ethic, you don't get the money. So you're right. I would just agree with volunteering because you can choose not to do it and you can make excuses. The job says show up. Yeah, it, you, you need, they need that responsibility. They also need to learn that uh, you're responsible for your own, like keeping yourself and providing shelter for yourself. Like you're the person responsible for that. It's not society. We're not responsible for your livelihood. You are. Um, yeah, I guess that's the only thing that I thought about whenever I read that line was that he recommended that they do that year and that they do it far away from the place where they grew up. And I, I don't know. I mean, if, if these kids are not emotionally ready to go to a college where they have a dormitory and a, and a cafeteria and how are they how would they really be able to go somewhere and actually feed themselves that far away from where they live? I don't know. Well, I think um, I, I like the idea. I just think, I mean, I do like the idea of it, of the gap year program. I just don't know. I don't know how we could do that unless it was kind of a, um, like a government instituted program, like a, you know, like Israel does or whatever, even Germany has a program like that too, where they, you have to either go into the service or do some sort of work, but the place where you go, I think they are responsible for your housing. So I guess that could work that way. Doesn't America already have some of a system like AmeriCorps that gives you a job and place to stay and a very small paycheck, but they still provide you with the things you mentioned. Yeah. Job the four. problem with I have with that stuff is it teaches you that you're a ward of the state and that your life, that you're a cog in the wheel and not a, uh, a cog in the machine and not an independent entity. So like, Hey, everyone has to do this voluntary service. I'm, you're not, you're not owned by the government. You're not the government's tool that has to go do service for the, the government in any particular way. You're your own individual. And the best way to actually do service is to go start a business and have to provide people something that they like enough to pay you for. That's yeah. how you get to society. I, mean, I like the idea of working much better. I just, in my mind, of course, I always go out to how do we implement this? Not just it's a great idea, but how could it be implemented? I was struggling with that. I actually yeah. think it starts so much earlier, though. I was watching um, a speech from like Ben Shapiro right before this, who I have come to love ever since I started getting into this stuff. And <laughs> he, he was talking about how he actually got asked this question of like, would you send your kids to college? And he said, if you don't have their morals and their val values locked down by like the time they're 14, you know, they're going to get indoctrinated in high school. You have to do it earlier than that. And, um, right. you know, I think about communities like, you know, the Mormons are not suffering this stuff to, to the best of my knowledge. Like the Mormons raise their kids to, to, to understand those values from day one and agree with them or not. But I don't think Mormon schools are having this particular problem. 
Yeah, well, because the Mormon families have very clear values that they transmit. And I think they, uh, while I don't agree with Mormon values, because I'm not a Mormon, uh, at, at least they're uh, inoculated against a lot of the social justice ideology, I think. And I don't think it's that hard to do. Like, if you teach your kid how to think independently and use reason, I mean, they don't, you can do that super... I mean, my daughter's 10. I'm pretty sure she's inoculated. Like she could be sent to Berkeley and, you know, she might, she might get beaten up, but she wouldn't, I don't think she would fall prey to their ideology. I wanted to um, just uh, uh, quickly ask my friend, my friend Kelly joined us. And if you don't want to talk, Kelly, you don't have to, but I want to say hello at least. And if you had, and I really, I respect your, um, the way that, at least what I know about how you parent. And I wanted to ask if you had any comments on the parenting section. And if you don't want to comment, no worries. Oh, I think you're muted. You must comment, Kelly. I'm going to unmute you. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe not on the parenting section per se, because I didn't finish the book. But um, in general, what my impression of all of this was was um like we try very hard when we parent uh to um to try to give them lots of uh room to fail uh they're they're pretty bright kids um carrie and i both went to a special high school um and so it's not surprising that um you know my children are bright also uh so we have him enrolled in um in a a, a class on the weekends where he learns um he learns Mandarin uh, with all of these other children. They're the only children who don't have anybody in the home who speaks Mandarin. Um, and their school is very easy, but then they go to these classes in the weekend and they 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 don't even know how to do a lot of the, the work. Um, uh, we want them to have a sense of what it's like to uh, to try something so phenomenally hard <laughs> that that you don't even know what to do with yourself. Um, that that you look at these Chinese characters and there you you remember like the the terror that you looked uh, you felt when you looked at them and had no idea what they meant, but you're expected to. Uh, but that little by little that they've been making progress, and so even though they're only like you know eight and ten years old, that they've been able to um, uh, have this history where they've try these very, very difficult things, things that they're by no means going to learn. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have any idea if they're going to learn Chinese, but we wanted to give them something in their childhood that they can just like fa fail spectacularly. And it's fine, like that it's nothing terrible happens to them. Um, we try to tell them things like, if you never fail at anything, then you are, you're just not even trying. <laughs> it means you're not doing anything hard. Um, I don't know what that will mean when they're teenagers or when they go to college, if, uh, if that's something that they'll have continue to take with them or anything like that. But we wanted to at least give them like this visceral feeling of what it's like to fail, but still be very, very supported by their family and by um, the other people in their class and things like that. That's great. I love the failure thing, by the way. And I can tell you what would happen because I know an adult whose parents uh, did not let her uh, go to a school with grades, never let them do anything competitive. They never wanted them to feel failure ever. And you can guess what she's most afraid of as an adult. Failure. So she doesn't do like it's, it's a, it's pretty clear. Um, on the resiliency side, uh, psychcentral.com on the ninth of this month to optimize learning fail 15% of the time. So you actually need to fail periodically and learn from your mistakes to maximize knowledge. Mm -hmm. But also if you think about people who have done anything groundbreaking, like there, there's not this, this one path where you're going to even know whether you've succeeded or failed. You, like you have to be able to, um, uh, in order to change paradigms or, or uh, think of something completely new and innovative, you have to be able to uh, get out of that mindset of what is the right answer? What is the right thing I'm supposed to be doing? Um, which is what I feel like a lot of school 
teaches. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's big in the startup world, right? The, the, one of the, uh, pieces of advice you get told a lot is to fail quickly, like fail often and fail quickly, right? You iterate really quickly. And, um, so you don't waste a lot of time going down the wrong path until you find something that works. Um, but that's not, uh, I don't think that's taught in schools very much. Well, and even to take it one step further, what we know about the most successful working groups in organizations is that the number one thing that sets them apart is they have a very high degree of psychological safety with one another. So they can take risks in front of one another and know that they'll be supported. They can fail and know it'll be okay. And that is completely disappearing in organizations. Like in the organizations that I work with, only 2% of them have highly resilient teams that have that high, high level of psychological safety. And it's only going to get worse and worse. Wow. Do you have any, so in your, in your profession, do you have any um, guidance or suggestions that you give for those? Or is it more that you're just evaluating and it's like, okay, good luck. Oh, I've got all sorts of suggestions, but the thing is like most of the time they don't listen. They don't do them. And it, it all comes back to like basic communication, basic trust building, and they don't do not listen. <laughs> no. Hey, so I have a guilty confession to make that I made to Carter before we started, which is that. Laura uh, was listening, so she already knows. Here's oh, she question. was listening. Yeah, I didn't, the very last part, uh, the part about how to fix this, the part of solutions I didn't read yet. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants to tell me how we're going to fit? Who wants to tell me about part five? <laughs> Are we going to talk? Is there, a, is there a silver lining to the end of this book? It's obvious stuff, right? It's colleges should do X. People should do Y. You should go to like, your kid should go to a gap year. Gap um, year. You should let them do free range parenting a little bit more. Um, you know, colleges should start looking like recruiting kids from schools that aren't, uh, focusing on academics as much as like kind of developing the person and you know again free play and that kind of stuff um parents limit social media yeah limit social media that's a good one yeah it wasn't I, anything profound it was kind of what you'd expect yeah from the book. Why, watch the way that words are used which is something you guys talk about all the time stop using the word safe or safety for anything other than physical safety so yeah. that they don't make that join between, you know, oh, these words hurt me. Uh, I didn't read it either, Carrie, but I found the beginning chapter about cognitive behavioral therapy very, very helpful. Like, he lists the nine different um, most common uh, uh, faulty frameworks. I, I don't remember what he calls them, um, but I found that uh, those to be very helpful, even just in in me looking at at my own life but i'm probably going to talk to my children a lot more specifically about those and um have them uh like like make kind of a game out of it like so so this thing that you're watching happening in uh like uh on tv or in in your school or something like that can you identify any of these uh these faulty frameworks that is probably what's going on here I think that that might be helpful because sometimes when you can put a name to something, then it's a lot easier to see it in life. He does talk about using CBT with your kids a little bit, and he he changes the acronym to Cognitive Behavioral Techniques and advises that you, you teach that to your kids, which I think is good. Um, he gives like some fine. links, right? He gives some links, doesn't he? He I, does. He gives, yeah. he gives some links. Um, also along those lines, something that, um, another book I read called Trauma Through a Child's Eye, I think, something like that. Um, interestingly, what, with kids, a lot of times it's the parent's reaction or, or the, it's what happens after the trauma that actually has the, the impact, not the trauma itself. And you can see this with little kids, when, like um, you see a little kid run and like fall, right? And there are the parents who will run over and be like, oh my God, Johnny, are you okay? And they make a big deal out of it. And then there's the parents who are usually were more like me or whatever, would be like, hey, you're fine, get up. Uh, and they wait. And if the kid's actually upset, then they'll react. But often the kid, you'll watch the kid and the kid will be looking to their parents to figure out like, should I be freaking out and crying right now? Or should I be getting up because it's really okay? And obviously if they're actually hurt, they'll comfort them. But uh, nine times out of 10, 
they look up at you and you're just kind of like, yeah, get up. They get up and move on. And that's the kind of, um, I don't know. That's a, I view that as a good metaphor for lots of ways to treat kids on more sophisticated levels, right? Is to not make a big deal out of something unless they're making a big deal out of it. I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. She's a, a economics mm-hmm. person. She's really smart. And she's got this thing called the Popsicle Index, which is the degree that you're comfortable letting your kid go down a couple blocks and get a Popsicle from the corner store and come back home again and feel like nothing bad's going to happen to them and they'll be fine and and they'll be able to manage that danger, the danger of that. And um, to, to the degree that, you know, communities are vibrant and, you know, happening, it's, it's a high index and if it's a ghetto or something terrible place and it's low. And, and, and I, I was always, I was reminded of her work when I was reading this book because it was just so much about that whole resiliency and, ha- and instilling that kind of like willingness to, to fail don't don't believe your feelings it's like it's okay it's like because you have a feeling they're they honor them but allow other inputs to help you decide you know what you're what's the right way forward and how how you're going to respond to challenges and stuff like that so anyway it was uh i i, I felt i felt like and in, that luke jobs input into it with the, the cbt i felt like it was that that was really the the, the sort of the sweetness, you know, of that. Because it, it I think with without him, with just height, it might have been rather dry. And there was a way that they brought this uh, CBT thing that really warmed up the whole presentation. Yeah, they personalized it by talking about Greg's... Um, personal experience. Depression, yeah, his personal experience. Um, by the way, we have a new person in chat as well, Chris Dotson. Welcome, Chris. You're muted, but hello. <laughs> we'll see. You're unmuted now. But we still don't hear you. So I guess we're wrong. Zoom thinks you're unmuted. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any any other uh, any other thoughts about the solutions? My, Carrie, honestly, they, they, I didn't see them to be. I don't think you missed a lot, but you can. I think, I think, well, from what you guys have said, and I did skim that last little part, it, uh, it looks like a lot of, like you said, he's a pragmatist. So these are a lot of pragmatic solutions and yes, hopefully will contribute to having kids who are more um, resilient and who are somewhat inoculated to the problems with anxiety and depression. But I think one major thing that was missing for me at, at one point he did talk about the philosophical underpinnings he did talk about marxism and he did talk about identity politics marxism but he briefly touched on it but i like the distinction he drew between um the the uh identity politics that martin luther king espoused which was an inclusive like let's find the common humanity and let's let's use we language and let's find what you, unites all of us versus right the social justice identity politics or, or um, the identity politics of the alt-right. It's the same thing. That's, that's an exclusive us against the enemy kind of identity <laughs> politics. And so um, I, I wish that some of the solutions had, had, um, had gone back to how to fight the under the underlying philosophy, the underlying yeah. uh, ideology that is, that is, that is, that is corrupting the way that people think or don't think I really count that part as philosophical i guess i guess he invoked the name of marx but it didn't it wasn't really a philosophical treatment of any of it um so i don't i don't think he had the tools to really go unravel where that came from um no we may have to we may have to wait for uh helen clark rose's book uh cynical thinking which yes it comes out next year <laughs> and that i'm pretty sure it's in well dive into exactly what we wish john and i uh, touched on yeah. Helen Pluckrose. Yeah. You know, a, a question to other parents out there. So one of the, I've been, free play has been something that I've been wanting to do like since my daughter was born, when wanting more of, but I've noticed a difference between when I grew up and when she grew up. Now, I don't know if it's just, I live in a different state in a different spot than when I grew up, but maybe other people can comment on this. Um, I feel like when I was growing up, there were a lot of other kids available in the neighborhoods that would be out playing. And so my, my parents could just be like, go outside. And 
I would run into a kid and actually they didn't even have to tell me to go outside because there were kids outside. So I would want to go outside. I can't do that. If I tell my daughter to go outside, she'll wander around for a while by herself and like come back in. There's not, there's not kids. It is, it is a little hard. It's a little hard. It's my greatest disappointment as parents <laughs> that my, I can't create a social experience. I wasn't able to create a social experience that I had. Me too. I, I had that where I was out. I hate it. And... I hate it. It's, you, you send your kids out to go meet kids and you end up meeting other moms and inevitably every other mother is more helicopter -y than I am or am I just letting go build a fort and somebody needs to don't come home till you break a leg work out all your arguments I don't want to hear from you get the fuck out of here there's no kids around who don't have parents who are very watchful all the time but which is that, weird. and also they're just so busy doing organized activities. I mean, if you have a family with three kids and all three kids are involved in an activity, I guarantee you that you're probably not at home. Like yeah. six yeah. days yeah. out of the week. You're hardly I mean, I don't I don't know how people did it. I only had one and working as a single mom and having one was tough. I don't know how some of these people do it with multiples and have them be involved in sports and Scouts. You have you have to homeschool. I mean, if you have more than three and they're like highly involved, you have more than one kid in a sport per season. You have to homeschool. But most of these parents are they're both working though, and so then that limits the amount of time that kids have for free play anyway. So something, I mean, something in the social structure itself is going to have to give to allow time for that free play to exist. Because, you know, as long as people just keep on um, packing that time with things, that won't exist. Awkward silence. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, Alan, even when he's not in his hammock, is always in the most comfortable position. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to relax. <laughs> it's my day off. You had to get in a relax, in a very relaxed position while you're shooting, uh, taking shots at rum. Yes, exactly. Well, that's that's but the don't, correct but don't way. Worry, man. Don't worry, man. I'll be right behind you. All right. Um, the thing about um, you know, I was really glad that I had two kids because with the so that they have were able to have a sibling dynamic and work out a lot more social stuff and i feel like if i had one kid uh, with the situation as it is now where there is everyone's either online or at a play group or um whatever the supervisional uh thing that it is the play dates it's like uh, it, it's like allows at least i was able to sort of encourage like them to go work out the conflict and go do their thing amongst themselves even though it's not the same thing as having a posse of kids that be running around and and as far as like what could i mean i've really thought about this as far as like how are we going to create the next generation and what is the next generation socially going to be structured as and i keep feeling like um uh, multiple like it's not it's not the traditional family it's not nuclear family i i really think the next thing is to have multiple like family pods and and have where you have six to 12 adults and x amount of kids and and I'd maybe rework the social uh or the sexual contract dynamic too i don't i don't know but i feel like something really radical needs to change as far as like how we are raising our kids and who who takes care of it and and maybe if we had like a, a pod of adults or clan taking care of income and outgo then maybe there might be something that that would actually be a solution i i need a pod of adults to come over and take care of my kids yeah. right now i think i i am that pod because like i decided to have my first son because madonna had a baby and she didn't need a man so i didn't get married I got pregnant with the baby I wanted and then I had a baby and I was like, oh, fuck, I need a man. So I stayed with my husband, <laughs> or, who was not my husband at the time. 
and we had another son and then we got married and then we had my one and only legitimate child, my third son. And then I got divorced and then I had a daughter with another person. So I am pod familying. So my, my ex-husband has a new wife who has kids and we're all like trying to set up a Disney vacation for next year where our whole combined families go together. It's not perfect and it's not idealized and it's very weird. And it's sort of the family of the time because of the decisions I made because of those sort of like inputs of, Oh, I can have a kid, but I don't need to be married and I don't need to have a nuclear family and I don't have to follow these rules. Um, but it's certainly not easy for anybody well, involved and it's not a pod. I, and I don't live in a communal situation where there's like what kind of you're talking about, but I mean, I can kind of see that. There's a more but, version of that, right? Like, so but, Alan, you know, if you, if you delete the sexual entanglements that were implied in your pod scenario, um, <laughs> It, it is something that yeah, part, like, I've part. talked about with friends where like, wouldn't it be nice? Because I have some friends that have kids also and we're scattered around the country. And, you know, in our idyllic environment, we live in a little community where our houses are next to each other and like we're all together. And that I have a that developing. Well, that's happening. So I have my at my church, um, which I've only been going to for a couple of years, they have done this so different um couples families have moved together to different parts of austin to different neighborhoods and i know in one case they like they they will pull money and help a couple buy put put a down payment on a home so they can all live together and raise their kids in proximity to one another and when i first heard that it blew my mind because i thought that's so radical and yet not radical. Like, why aren't more people doing this? If you have a shared philosophy, I mean, they all go they, to the same church and have the same belief system. And um, a lot of their kids go to the same school, which is a combination of um, it's part homeschooling and part uh, private, like a classical school, like uh, they're getting a classical education. And um, so, so why not be, you know, in an area where their kids can play together. And I don't know, I thought that was a really good cool idea. And the fact that they are, are taking the Christian principles to heart of like generosity and giving there's a need. And if you can't afford a house, we're going to help you so we can be in the same neighborhood. That was mind blowing to me. I love that idea. I would love to be part of a community like that. And that's sort of like going back to like sort of a traditional, what in my mind I see is like, you know, the idealized America where we all take care of each other and we all take care of each. For me, it all boils down to like, authority over each other's children. I want a principal that's able to beat my kids when they're being bad. I want to have another parent next door that when my kid's misbehaving, he says something. It's like, when I go to Disney World, I feel like there should be this pact between parents because there's always the kid melting down, making things awful, right? And, and kids always misbehave worse for their own parents. But if we had parents who weren't their parents who were like, Oh, we're all in this together and we're all a team and you're going to respect elders authority. And like, if, if my kids misbehaving at Disney world, I used to like beg for this when we went on family vacations, like, Hey, if your kid gets out of line, I'll go yell at it. If my kid gets out of line, you yell at him because he's not going to listen to me, but they get more afraid by other parents and they straighten up. <laughs> but if we get like, share this sort of like parenting <sighs> don't you talk to my kid like that your... i'll smack you if you talk to my kid like that don't well, you say you're problem. gonna do that i'll get no uh -uh. i think, People, I think you have I'm to have gonna... shared parenting philosophy to do that yeah. Yeah. You, you really not do and, and they don't, you have to no. find those other parents that are like at the wavelength where it's like okay if your kid disrespecting <laughs> okay. you i'm gonna come over and be like don't talk okay. to your mother that way <sighs> you have to find them but i want to live in a, in a little sweet community where we all pay each other's mortgages and then we all tell each other's kids like a, a, don't be a shithead to your mother <laughs> well for the record i don't want to pay anyone else's mortgages and <laughs> uh, and uh i'm into peaceful parenting and rational uh conversation i i don't i don't hit my kids so uh i would not let someone else in fact if someone hits my kids i will hit them 
So. No, I'm not talking about actually beating them. I'm talking about that, like scaring them, like a little like I tone of voice from a stranger fear. will go a long way. I don't. If they threaten to hit my kids, I'll hit them. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're the problem, Carter. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm very adamantly against using authority and fear to raise children. I think it causes problems. Um, well, but, it, would be, it would be nice if teachers at least had guts. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Here we are. Fine. fine. All good with I'm that. I'm home. What um, are you doing? Uh oh. Hello. Just so you know, I'm gonna have to go soon, Carter. So I think, and also, we've done an hour and a half. So I was wondering if we could do soon. We don't have to do it yet, but like final thoughts from people. Well, I wanted to read a quote that um okay that Wolfgang sent. Wolfgang, I would let you read it, but your microphone sucks. So I'm gonna read it. <laughs> and I think mine is finally working. So sorry, I can just say hi. I'm Chris. <laughs> oh, hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. It works now. Nice to meet you. We should nice like to meet you. Chris, do you have something to say before we do the quote thing? Um, I'll, I'll just throw in on the last thing. I'm sorry I joined late. I was listening, but I got your email late. Um, anyways, um, yeah, the intentional community thing. I've known a few people that also lived in that sort of scenario and they were always so precocious and uh and well formed and i just think it's it's yeah i mean it's definitely an ideal solution if you can make it work yeah i i mean we may have to end up doing that at some point we have some better solution than rewriting all our books to the play dates of huckleberry finn i think that was one of the quotes in the book yeah that was an awesome one i liked all the book yeah. title rewrite that was great well yeah uh, there was a Harry Potter one too. Yeah. It was something about sitting around and doing nothing. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So Wolfgang pointed out, I think you said this is one of your favorite quotes, the Van Jones quote in the book, which was great. I if you don't want to be safe really emotionally, really sorry, he okay. says, I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I want you to be strong. That's different. I'm not going to pave the jungle for you. Put on some boots and learn how to deal with adversity. I'm not going to take all the weights out of the gym. That's the whole point of the gym. This is the gym. This is uh, uh, Van Jones speaking about the campus culture. And I, I agree. I thought it was a good That's what college is for. It was, it was specifically regarding the new safe spaces. Van Jones was uh, given a, uh, a pro and a con sign to it. And that was the only con. The safe spaces were making people too fragile. Yeah. Yeah. Carrie, do you have uh, you have a, a final thought you want to add? No, that was that was also I love that quote. It was one of my favorites too. And again, because it's coming from someone on the left, and I I really when he said that, I remember it being a big moment. It felt like oh great, you know. Again, so I, I just like Obama recently um, talking about uh, call out culture, and I, I really appreciate it when well respected figures on the left. Uh, and liberals start are, are are not afraid to be critical of this because it's not liberalism. It's not liberalism to protect people. And part of the reason I refuse to let people take the term liberal from me is because, you know, like liberals, free speech is a liberal value. You know, supporting uh, a variety of viewpoints is a liberal value. <laughs> like allowing people to form arguments. Uh, I can. Hear, uh, I can hear feedback that but uh <laughs> anyway i think i i just i like that i like that i it's it was one of my favorite quotes of the book as well and i love that it's from a person that left that's it okay on that note carrie you and i are gonna have to uh figure out a book for next time but i gotta say i'm in the mood for fiction after this um, we might need to do a buffer who was it at the beginning it suggested was that you carlin yes <laughs> And Carlin, can you show us what you've been knitting? Yes, okay. I can. It's a sweater, actually, by one of the knitters that got in trouble. Oh. That's how nice. I got so far. Yeah. It's a halter top sweater right now. It is right now, but it's getting longer. It's getting longer every day. <laughs> yeah, well, totally. Thanks. Andrew's yeah. Andrew's making fun of me saying I want a book that's not so serious. I don't, I just want a book that's like yeah, maybe it's just not so serious. I don't know. I I'm, I read two Jonathan Hype books back to back, and I kind of want like, I don't know, 
we read fiction before. I want to go back to fiction. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we could come up with something cool as a buffer between this because I do want to do the madness of crowds, but we, I like the poll. We can do another poll. I want to do uh, madness of crowds hey, also. Yeah. Have Just you read uh, The Iron Web by uh, Larkin Rose? That's really good. Mm -mm. That one. It's a novel. Okay. Well, then, it, then we can throw it in the possibilities. Um, all right. Carrie, any last comments, thoughts? Thank you guys for showing up. And thank you for all of your contributions and putting the time in to read the book and come with insights. And I just really love this community that we're building. And I hope that everybody um, can come out to see. Uh, we're gonna we're planning a retreat. There's no date yet, but we're gonna hopefully do it in with enough lead time that people can make plans if they want to come. And hi, it'll Laura. See your kitty. It'll be in Texas. <laughs> What's your cat's name? This one is Molly. Hi, Molly. We had, we just had a, a litter of six and um, we had all six of them given away. We had, we had a cat that adopted us about in April and then she immediately got pregnant. We had six kids. It was just, I thought it was going to be a disaster, but they actually brought me a lot of joy. But, and, and my husband and my son are both avid cat haters. They hate cats so much. And both of them have now turned into teddy bears. They're like that. My husband is like that meme on the internet of the pet hitting dad. You know, we have three dogs and now we have three cats total because two of the ones that got given away, one of them, my husband decided he was going to Indian give it and take it back. I probably shouldn't use that phrase. Should I? I'm and sure it's problematic. We're all offended. It's problematic. Oh. And then, <laughs> And then, uh, then another one was crying so much of its new home that it came home uh, back to us. And my husband said that we had to keep it. We just had to. So Cat Hater now has three cats. They're a lot of fun. They get into everything, though. They're like toddlers. Yes. Well, speaking of cat haters turned cat lovers, Carter, final hey, words. Carter. We still fight about how much I dislike the cat. Um, we, it's not fighting. I just, you know, whatever. It's fine. Cats are fine. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Carrie, I also really like the community here. I mean, we don't always agree on everything, but um, that, that everyone's conversation is thoughtful, and we have really good, um, uh, you know, viewpoints on stuff. People have take, you know, come up come up with really interesting takes on things and y'all put in the work and read the book. And so, um, I don't know, I really enjoy these book clubs and I enjoy our community a lot. I wish we could spend uh, more time and I'm looking forward to actually doing a real life thing. That should be, that should be fun. It will be in Texas and we will get to shoot. So, and, so there you go. So much deflecting on the cat dislike there, Carter. It's not a dislike. I just don't, I don't care. You're not supposed to say you don't care. I literally just don't care which I think makes me sound more cold than disliking the cat. I just don't care. Um, so anyway, all right. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. And we will see you uh, tomorrow for some version of Kopefi. So, Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. <laughs>